I think we'll we'll go ahead and uh, and get started, and and uh, I know others will be trickling in shortly. So uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thanks for joining us uh, on what is I have to say a truly uh, bittersweet uh, event. Um, we're here to celebrate Marty's tenure here at MSK as our chief of the leukemia service. Um, I know we'd all rather be doing this uh, event face to face, uh, but of course the virus rules the day. Um, there are plans for, for something uh, more in person, which, which Marcel will uh, discuss later. Um, you'll hear a few words from those uh, from uh, folks uh, who've seen how Marty has transformed uh, the service from what it was, uh, those he's worked with, and, and a few of those who he's mentored. Um, following this, there'll be a uh, virtual mingle and an attempt to uh, be able to have everyone have a chance to connect with Marty. You will all be aliquoted into breakout rooms that Marty will uh, visit so uh, we can have a more, more uh, of a small group uh, interaction as best as allowed by this platform. Um, I'll begin with a few brief remarks uh, before I turn things over to our uh, list of uh, distinguished speakers. So um, when you think about an individual's impact um, on a field or an institution, how do you really measure that? Or how do you measure someone's impact? Perhaps by academic contributions or advancement of the field, um, maybe by dedication to the care of patients, which is harder to quantify, but probably equally important. And I needn't explain to this audience uh, Marty's tremendous success in, in both of these areas. But I might argue that one's most lasting contribution may be reflected in and by the people you mentor and those whose careers you foster. If you wanna begin to understand Marty's contribution in this regard, uh, particularly at this institution, take a look at our faculty roster. By my rough count, I think roughly 50% of our current faculty spent all or some of their clinical training with Marty. And indeed, judging by this measure, Marty's imprint will remain on the fabric of the leukemia service and this institution for years, possibly decades with some luck to come. This is not to mention those who started their careers here under his mentorship and have gone on to establish themselves as faculty at other leading institutions around the world. Uh, I had, I've had the great fortune to have had Marty as my clinical mentor during my training here. And indeed, I learned the science and the art of taking care of chronic and acute leukemia patients from him in much the way that an apprentice learns from a master craftsman. In more recent years, I've also had the fortune to develop as a leader under his guidance. But I think perhaps the thing that I learned the best and most uh, admired about him is his unique ability uh, to connect with people. I remember my first meeting with Marty uh, when I was a first year fellow. I met with him to discuss joining his clinic uh, during the second year of fellowship. And of course I was nervous and excited to be talking to one of the leukemia greats. I studied his, at that time, New England Journal paper on Donna Rubison dosing and AML. I read that paper backwards and forwards and sideways. I knew it in and out before I walked into that meeting with him. I was prepared to discuss all the nuances of AML induction with him. And you know what we ended up talking about during that meeting? We talked about movies. We talked about the movies that we had recently seen. At first, I was very confused, but it was really at that moment that I first observed what I would uh, see time and again uh, as a fellow in Marty's clinic. Marty's unique ability to create a connection with somebody, to try to understand uh, him or her on some level before anything else. I can think of a few more important gifts for a physician, particularly in our, in our field of work to have. I would consider myself lucky to develop a, a profound ability to, the, to a fraction of the ability that Marty has. But at the end of the day, I'll always be grateful that I had a chance to learn from the best. So with that introduction, I'm going to turn things over to our list of speakers today. Uh, Ross was uh, to speak first, but he is, uh, has an issue to take care of and hopefully will join us shortly. So our first speaker will be uh, Dr. Scheinberg. Um, thanks, Rajit. So I guess it's appropriate since 
with Ellen not on the phone, I'm the oldest member of this service. Um, and I guess I thought to echo some of what you've said, you know, illustrate how much change has occurred um, as a consequence of Marty um, and what he's brought to the service. You know, when I took over now 30, exactly 30 years ago, the leukemia service was a mixture of a private practice and a cottage industry. We had Tim G running his own private leukemia service, Bert Lee running a cash business for lymphoma, myeloma. We, the leukemia service actually took care of everything that wasn't called a lymphoma. We had a heme, we had auto transplant, we had myeloma, uh, Allo transplant was actually run by the pediatric service, Rich O'Reilly. So it was a really chaotic, strange service. Um, I actually wasn't on the leukemia service when I was appointed chief. David Goldie called me in the office one day and he said, um, we couldn't get Bob Gale, so I'm stuck with you. Um, so I tried to focus the service on leukemia and we were pretty successful at least getting physicians and young scientists who wanted to treat leukemia and discover things about leukemia. But we never really had a national presence. You know, Ellen Berman had run some national trials of Ida Rubison, but we were mostly still focused on some early stage drugs. We did arsenic and, a, and a red oak acid, some antibodies. And, um, and when I stepped out a decade later, we really thought we needed somebody who was going to bring you know, an international um, scope to the leukemia service, given the volume of patients we had, perhaps the second largest in the country. And we looked at the usual suspects. Marty was, of course, you know, high on the list, but Marty was not interested. It's not, it wasn't clear. Um, he had this sort of pathological love of Chicago. I, I, it's, not, it's still obviously from what he's just announced, he's still got this problem, but we couldn't get Marty and Ellen Berman and Joe Jersick sat in for a couple of years, you know, as acting chiefs. And finally, we said, we got to figure out how to get Tallman here. And I, I flew to Chicago and we had, um, I don't know if it was a late breakfast or a lunch. And we met and I tried to twist his arm. And he still, he still wasn't that interested. So I knew a guy in Chicago who put a dead horse in his bed and, um, and finally, Marty, Marty decided to come to New York. And, um, and he's, he really transformed the service um, in, in over, that, over his first 10 years. You know, I was in clinic today, which I do occasionally, and I saw some of the new um, young physicians who I don't even know their names. I think Stein is the oldest of the young physicians, and he's barely out of high school. So it's, it's amazing to see all these young people and that's why when people were sort of surprised and saddened when Marty was leaving, I was thinking you shouldn't be um, saddened because the service is in great hands with, you know, Ron Paul is running a, you know, doing a great job. He did a great job during the, the uh, pandemic early on. All the young faculty uh, that I know and don't know are amazing. Um, and that's what you're supposed to do. You come in, you put your mark on it as Marty, um, as Marty did, and then you, and then it, you step aside and let the people you you've uh, mentored take over. Um, and um, you know, there's, you know, I, I was thinking because I recently also stepped down from the, or at least I, I'm trying to step down from the chair. And I was thinking that these jobs are like owning a boat. I don't know if any of you, any of you have ever owned a boat, but the two greatest days in owning a boat are the day you buy the boat and the day you decide to sell the boat. And so Marty's probably thinking the, 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 the greatest day of his life is when he decided he was going to get out of the chief of leukemia job and, and go back to doing something he, he also liked. Because, you know, it's fun for a while, but then, you know, you got to turn it over to somebody else. And um, the, the wonderful thing is the service is in an extraordinary shape. Marty's leaving at the peak of, you know, in, in national stature. He was just head of ASH. Um, and you know, it's, it's fantastic to see what a wonderful job he's done and, and where he's left the service um, in far better shape than when I left the service uh, uh, 15, 20 years ago. So um, 
I actually have a toast. Um, I don't know if anyone else has had. This is a, a, a um, Chateau Neuf de Pop, 2019. So, Omar, what are you drinking? Beer? <laughs> you should try them. It's so funny, David. No, this is the seltzer water. <laughs> oh. Anyway, I just finished clinic, so I always finish clinic with a glass of red wine. There you go. Anyway, Marty. Um, I think you made the right decision. It's good for you. It's good for the service. You did an amazing job and uh, to better things in Chicago and, and great things in New York. And hopefully you won't disappear completely. <laughs> Thank you, David, very much. Cheers. Would be a, 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 tough, a tough speech to follow, but, but Omar is, is, uh, has some comments next. Thanks, Rajit. Yeah, no, definitely hard to follow that. I, I do want to share a personal anecdote uh, about Marty. I don't even know that I've ever discussed this with Marty, but, you know, it's not often I can remember the precise moment that I've met someone or a mentor. And with Marty, I can remember it exactly. In fact, it was it's on my CV because it's the first public professional presentation I ever gave. I met Marty that same day. It was in Chicago. I don't know if Marty remembers this. It was around 2007. Um, I uh, was in a second year fellow. I was in Ross's lab at the time, and uh, he had been invited to give a talk in Chicago, the Waxman Foundation. And uh, his wife and him, I guess the baby came early and uh, Ross couldn't go and was kind enough to send me instead to give this lecture. And I went there again, first professional presentation, really didn't have a lot of time to prepare or think about it, didn't have a lot of data either. <laughs> And I uh, gave the talk there and remember it very, very well. And I distinctly remember Marty coming up to me afterwards, introducing himself. I had no idea who he was and basically saying very kind things to me. We had a really nice discussion afterwards. And I just remember it really had a strong impression to me how kind he was. And I didn't know that he was going to join us at MSK a few years later at that point. And uh, I was amongst one of the first uh, faculty that joined when, when Marty came. We went from having a large number of clinical faculty to very few at the time. I think I did the entire month of December when I first joined on service. And I just also very impressed at that time how much Marty uh, really seemed to be so calm and handling it all so well. Um, and so it's really just been a real pleasure working alongside Marty and going from, you know, considering him a mentor to a colleague and also now a friend very much. And uh, really uh, looking forward to continuing to work together. We're going to be doing quite a few things together still as we move to Northwestern Chicago. And I really look forward to continuing our work together and our friendship. And that's basically what I, what I wanted to share. Thank you, Omar. So next, we're going to hear from probably the person who has worked, I would say, closest with Marty over these last few years. Uh, Bernadette Vela, who is uh, his, his, uh, who's the APP who's been working with Marty for years. Bernadette? Thank you, Rishi. So of course, saying goodbye is never easy and trying to sum up the nine years in a three minute Zoom is even harder, but here goes. I've been thinking, what made the team good? Because we were somewhat of an unlikely pair. And Raman would often say, the only thing we had in common is that the two of us could not type, which is true. So Marty was always very cheerful and he was filled with optimism. And I was always very serious and always um, somewhat of a realist and maybe with a touch of pessimism. And whenever we had a problem, I would always react with a lot of emotion and some nervous energy. But Marty was always calm cool, collected. He could quickly and quietly get any problem under control. And when he did, he would turn to say, another fire douse, and we would move on. But for all of our differences, what we truly had in common was our dedication and devotion to the patients and their families. And the patients knew this. They knew that we cared. They knew that we were there for them 24 seven. And many would say that they felt more like they were part of a family than a patient. And that is what made it work. And so in these past few weeks, with all the goodbyes that we have said to patients, what has come across loud and clear is that Marty, you have touched many lives. You have helped many patients just by simple acts of kindness. And as for me, 
you showed me how important it is to give hope to patients and families because you showed patients that they could live with their leukemia and you showed them that their days and their lives did not need to be measured or defined by their diseases. And so, although this is an end of an era for me, probably one that I will never see again, it is with a very grateful heart that I'm very proud to say I was part of a great team, Team Tallman. And so Marty, I thank you very much and I wish you all the best. Thanks so much, Bernadette. Beautiful words, thank you. Okay, next. Jay, the floor is yours. Oh my gosh, that was such a beautiful words by Bernadette and just getting hotter and hotter to <laughs> go after. Um, so, I mean, I, I work with Marty since, you know, the beginning of, uh, you know, the third year fellowship. I think he came uh, during my beginning of my third year and I was very, very fortunate to uh, join his clinic as, my, uh, as his continu um, continued fellows. Not a lot of competition at the time. Um, so I was able to kind of get into his clinic when he first joined. Um, it was very fortunate and kind of life career changing experience for me. Um, at the time I was working in Winier's lab, trying to find my niche and what I was going to work on. And uh, the Marty, as everybody has tested, has been so kind and generous actually with his time, um, even working on a project together that he is actually the first person to suggest, you know, you wanted to work on this project right on this one. And it was he gave you a lot of freedom, uh, but at the same time, enough of a guidance to succeed. And then when it comes down to the, the authorship or the credits, and he gave you full credit, probably more deserving than what I, you know, the, more than what I really deserve to get. But he really take you, he really helped me to kind of take it far. And I knew how to write a kind of clinical paper with Marty. I wrote my first blood paper with Marty on APL. That's how I got into the APL. And I, all the experts that he had, and I was able to follow an APL, Harry Cell, um, and also the ALN and AML in other areas uh, with you know, the Dan and others kind of met co-mentoring at that time. But it was really instrumental to get the, uh, kind of get those projects together. I, you know, again, as Omar said, I vividly remember my first an APL kind of early death project, which you know, was the beginning of it. And it was so much fun and editorial and, um, and kind, of, kind of going in and the hairy cell projects with the, you know, the BRF inhibitor, which was all possible due to his expertise and his generosity again, to kind of let me run with it. Um, and you know, the, he had a, so much connections and network, a lot of res, you know, people respected him. So it was a lot easier to get the funding for this and then a project really got them going. So none of this would have been possible without your help. And, and over the really the 10 years, and as everybody said, I am so grateful for what you have done for me. Uh, I, think, I don't think I've been able to accomplish in the short amount of the time and kind of what I did without, uh, kind of without you. And I'm always amazed, and I tell everybody that I need is, uh, I'm always amazed how you are able to respond all your emails so quickly, manage billion things all at the same time, manage this incredible service, and take cell phone calls all the time from your patients. I don't know how you do it, but you know it is going to be really, really hard act to follow and take over some of your patients because they have a high expectation, and I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm going to try my best, but it's going to be hard, but I'm always amazed. And you had a set of, a kind of role model for me and certainly as a kind of the, what a good leukemia and a good clinician uh, as a doctor kind of that could be just really not really generous with everyone, not just with us as your mentees, but you're with your patients, your colleagues, I've never seen you get angry, raise your voice, get upset at anything, total calm through the whole fire as Bernadette said. And I think that's, um, I think I, something that I'm always going to try to follow and emulate uh, kind of as I grow in this, um, in, in, uh, as an academic physician and as a doctor too, as, and as a person, as a father, I think is what an incredible kind of the character that, um, that you have. And hopefully I can follow, follow your footsteps. So I, I'm going to miss you so much, but I'm, I know I'm going to work with you and many different projects kind of moving forward. So I'm going to continue to bother you and meet up and kind of do all the things. But I just wanted to really thank you for everything that you've done for the service and then uh, for me. Thanks, Jay. Thanks, Jay. Eitan, the floor is yours. 
Sure. So thanks. So in 2006, as a bright eyed medical student, at the end of my third year clinical rotations at Northwestern, I was confronted with picking my first elective rotation for the fourth year of medical school. I had a vague notion that I wanted to treat really sick patients, not the walking well, that are usually seen in the general internist's office. So hematology oncology, I thought. Those patients really need a doctor. And so I picked a hematology rotation. And the first day of that rotation, on the 15th floor of the Feinberg Pavilion, just off of the Magnificent Mile, I first encountered Marty, whom I then knew as Dr. Tallman, a scholarly looking man with glasses and a shock of gray hair. I was of course nervous. And in one of my first presentations on rounds, I described that a patient who recently was treated with a new drug called Mylotarg had developed right lower quadrant abdominal pain. At the end of the presentation, Dr. Tallman asked, did you use your plexor and pleximeter to examine the patient's abdomen? I had no idea what Dr. Tallman was talking about. And at home that evening, I discovered that a pleximeter is a device used in percussion as part of a clinical examination to absorb the energy generated by the strike from the plexor, and that during percussion, the middle finger of it, the examiner's hand, is routinely used as a plexor. It was this interest in medical history, and to some extent, the medical minutia that I enjoyed, and I thought, this guy's a little bit quirky, but I want to stick around him and learn from him. There were other things I learned from Dr. Tallman as a med student on rounds in 2007, some unusual and some now considered common knowledge. I learned that two causes of priapism are sickle cell anemia and leukostasis. I learned about a new drug called desatinib, which in certain cases could cause pleural effusions. And I kept learning from Dr. Tallman, rounding with him as an intern and a resident at Northwestern, joining him as a first year fellow at MSK on the inpatient leukemia service, being in his clinic as a second and third year fellow with the 7 a.m. start time, and having the benefit of being a colleague for nearly nine years. And over that time, I started learning certain what I will call Tallman-isms. When I had a patient with AML with a white blood count of 45,000 as an intern and paged Marty as he was sitting with his son at a Chicago Bulls game saying I wanted to Luca Faris, he kindly said, we don't usually see patients with a white blood count of 45,000 develop leukostasis, but I trust your judgment, instead of telling me that perhaps I was being overly anxious. I learned that when Marty rounds, and every time I've rounded with him, there will always be a patient with a hint of proptosis, and he will ask if we should check thyroid function. I've learned that Marty likes speaking French to patients from France and in taxis with taxi drivers from Haiti, knows a few words in nearly every language, a sheshe in Chinese and a dos vidanya in Russian. I've learned that when a pharma company wants to exclude a patient from participation in a study, the best answer is, but what does the protocol say? And overall, I've learned the value of conducting outstanding clinical research and outstanding mentorship. As I mentioned, I've had the good fortune to spend the bulk of my medical education and professional career with Marty as a mentor. Above all, more than the research, the administrative skill, and the leadership of the Leukemia Service, ECOG, and ASH, Marty has made a difference in the lives of thousands of patients over the years. They trust him like family, and I've seen how many, and I don't use this word lightly, love him for the care he provides, his gentle nature, and his ability to explain a complex disease in a simple way. Perhaps the biggest loss to our leukemia service is the loss of Marty as an expert clinician who will no longer be the calm presence taking care of our patients in need at MSK. I want to end with a Talmudic tale that for me, highlights Marty's contribution to my and I think many of our careers. In the Talmud, the story is told about a man named Akiva, who is an uneducated shepherd. At the age of 40, he decides to change careers and spends 12 years immersing himself in the study of Jewish law. When he returns as a rabbi, in fact, the greatest jurist in the land of Israel, around the same time Jesus is preaching in the same area, he knocks on the door of his house, sees his family, and says, what I have is because of you. Marty, I want to express a similar thought. What I have, what we have academically and professionally is because of you. Simply put, you are a mensch beyond all mensches who we will miss dearly when you depart back to Chicago. Thank you very much.
Thanks, Satan. Anthony? Wow, lots of great speeches. Um, I wrote down some comments. <clears throat> to begin with, I wanted to say that working for Marty was one of the, beyond one of the major factors in me leaving Penn and coming to MSK. And, you know, I'd known about Marty for years, uh, hearing about his leadership in AML and APL and hairy cell, a long list of diseases, uh, you know, years before I ever applied for the job. But I didn't really know him personally. I never met him before I interviewed here. But from the moment I got there for the interview, I was struck by the fact that he had this vision, not only for what he idealized for the service, but, but also what he wanted for the CLL program. And to begin with, he was absolutely committed to CLL being part of the leukemia service. And I also really should give him the credit for recognizing years before I ever came to MSK or even thought about it, that he really recognized that we had all of the key components in place for MSK to have an excellent CLL program. And what I loved on the first time that I met him, that he said, I only want you to come here if you envision our program being the best in the world. So he had such aspirations. And he also promised to provide all of the resources and the support to make that happen. For me, as appealing as all that was in terms of wanting to come to MSK, really what the deciding factor that led me to make the move was the appealing nature of the culture that Marty had created on the leukemia service, something that I could have contrasted to other uh, experiences that I had. And the best way I could describe Marty's culture is one of mutual respect, kindness, tolerance for everyone on the service. And I remember him distinctly telling me the day that I met him, he said, I'm not interested in hiring a bull in a china shop, which is the first time I ever heard that phrase, or, or being one myself. And in this, in every regard, he led by example. Uh, many times when thinking about how to conduct myself at work, I really think about what or how Marty might do things. In, in coming to MSK, I really have zero regrets except for today in that I have to say goodbye to him as a friend and as a leader uh, in his capacity as a service chief. And I can honestly say that he's kept his word to me personally and my contract and all of the conversations we ever had uh, since the time that I came here, which I think few could say of leaders uh, that they've worked with in the past. I greatly respect his ability to lead our service, but at the same time, allow me personally the latitude to grow and develop a program independently in terms of academic direction and growth and clinical research and, and, and clinical um, clinical goals. In addition, there were a few instances which Marty and I could talk about privately where, you know, I really needed his professional support and guidance. And, you know, seeing Marty as your advocate is quite impressive. Uh, he was a partner and a fearless defender of our team and our academic mission. And I really grew great respect for how tough he really can be. Jay said he never yells at anybody, but Marty can be really tough when he wants to be. Um, I'll always cherish the four years I had, MSK, had at MSK getting to know Marty and working for him. Very lucky to be here during his tenure. And like all great leaders and mentors, I really look forward to the next chapter. I also continue to look at him as an example of leadership, professionalism, and how I continue to hope to improve my own conduct at work to the ideal that he really represents. And I'll also miss our morning chats. And along those lines, you know, my office has been next to Marty through two buildings now for the past four years. And so he truly is a gentleman and that I should apologize for the noise, the mess, the music, the large meetings that we've put him through in a very small space being next to him over the years, stealing the chairs outside his office and filling up his garbage pails with food after or garbage after we filled up our own. But, you know, we really took you for your word, Marty, that you wanted an active program 24 seven. But I think we've been a little bit loud in doing so. But in all seriousness, I, I want to thank you for hiring me and really thank you for your honorable leadership and also your friendship. Best of luck. Thanks, Anthony. Okay. I, uh, Ross, uh, I think, is unfortunately uh, indisposed and I don't think he's going to be able to speak. So um, the, last, the last speaker will be uh, Marcel. Sorry, just had to unmute. Um, so this is incredibly difficult to follow after all of these fantastic speeches. So many heartfelt, beautiful words were actually spoken. I um, want to go back to where David um, started also. When we started the search, looking for a candidate for this service that David had also led for so many years, everybody mentioned Marty. It was pretty obvious that everybody knows Marty and 
I have learned now also that you know everybody um, any, and you have memorized everybody's name and you know something about them. I've never met anybody who knows so many people within the field. So it was clear from your track, track record, uh, your clinical research leadership, uh, et cetera, that you would be an outstanding uh, candidate. But it really was clear to me um, how, what a giant you are within the field. When I once met, just give you a little anecdote, for the first time with Baselga. Baselga wanted to make it clear in the first meeting that he knew nothing about Ahim and didn't care about Ahim, um, and that we could just do whatever we wanted. But he did ask me one thing, who hired Marty? Because he thought that that was something exceptional that we had done, that we were able to bring Marty uh, here. And that brings me to the phrase that I've heard many times out of your mouth, uh, stature. Um, first of all, I think we can say that you have brought a lot of stature to our service, to our field, um, to our division, to our center. Uh, but it was your favorite phrase also when we would discuss uh, candidates. Typically now when we had a Zoom meeting, you would lean forward into the camera and then with a little pause, you would tell me, he brings stature or she brings stature to our service. And I would always back off and I thought, okay, then, then this person must be really good because I trust your taste. Your taste has been absolutely fabulous when it comes to hiring, mentoring, recruitment. And it's not just within our service or within your service, but it's also for the whole, um, for the whole division. It was very obvious um, that having Marty Tolman here was a magnet for all of Ahim to get fantastic people to uh, join us. One of these people is on one of the Zoom windows here, Shil Sal, right? Who, thanks to your leadership of that search, is now part of our center. Um, many people, or at least one, but other people have mentioned it outside of these speeches, have mentioned the phrase mensch. Uh, it's obvious that you are a mensch. I think everybody who knows you realizes that, but I would... I would like to go and call you also a class act and a gentleman. Um, I have now some intel because your former uh, assistant, Raman, is now in my office. And I asked her, does he really never get angry? Is he really never upset about something? And she basically confirmed that that never happens. I've had so many meetings with you where I felt that I was acting like a barking dog or something, and you kept your quiet and your calm. <laughs> you made me feel like an idiot, but somehow we got through with it. I think in many cases we did the right thing. So um, you've been so collaborative in so many ways at our center for so many programs. You've been a superb mentor, as you've heard from many, many people and many people on these Zoom, uh, Zoom windows have been mentored uh, by you. It's obvious that you are a superstar within the field and at MSKCC. And everybody can see that, of course, because you're the current or the ex-president uh, of ASH. So many um, reasons um, to praise you. I was told I have only three, uh, three minutes and I could go on for a long, long time talking about all of the fantastic things that, uh, that you've done and how much I'm going to miss you. Um, but since we all realize that these kind of Zoom meetings um, are not the best way to say bye to somebody who has done so much for our field and for us, um, you have been so kind to uh, agree to our plan to bring you back here next year when COVID has died down and then honor you uh, with a symposium, a, a scientific uh, symposium, where you will be, of course, the main act. Uh, but with your help, we will hopefully pick some good speakers and we'll have a wonderful day with a wonderful dinner. And we'll have much more time then to say um, to say the many things we would like to say to honor you. So thank you again for everything that you've done for the service, for the division, for MSKCC, for ASH, for the field, but most of all for our patients, because apart from all of the things we've mentioned already, you're also one of the busiest uh, clinicians within our uh, division. So thank you, thank you, thank you, Marty. And uh, cheers with my spin drift. Thanks, Marcel.
Right. Now, uh, Dr. Stein is, is going to take the long walk down to your office, Marty, and uh, present you with something on behalf of the institution, the division, the service. Do I have to put on my mask? Uh, I would. Yeah, applaud me. On train. Oh, I don't think nice. it's safe. Oh, how sure. nice. Can you see it? Oh, very nice. I can't read it myself. I don't know what it is. Here, I can read it. I'll read it. It's it out of focus. Yeah. It says, uh, in recognition, Memorial Hospital Alumni Society, American Society of Hematology President, in recognition of tenure as the 2021 ASH president and 11 years of service at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, committed to advancing cancer therapy and improving the lives of patients with leukemia, Martin Tallman, 2021. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Beautiful. It couldn't be nicer. Marty, the, the, the floor is all yours. Well, thank you. First of all, how fun, how fun is this, having your best friends and colleagues say nice things about you? It makes me think I should be leaving more often. Someone once said to me, as David suggested, that it's better to leave when people want more than when they say they've had enough. So I hope I'm in the former category. We have four, Wendy and I have four wonderful children, two daughters and two sons. Both the sons are married. One of the sons went on with his wife to have a baby, as you may know, many of you may know. And so we have our first grandchild born uh, about five months ago. And this induced a gain of function mutation which altered a gene first in my wife, I call it a homing gene, and then in myself, I acknowledge. So Wendy really wants to be closer to our children and uh, our new grandchild. And that was really the motivating factor for my move. Otherwise, I would have stayed here another 12 years if possible. When you're, doing a, for, when you're recruiting someone and they don't come, they often blame it on the spouse. It's easy to blame it on the spouse. But I'm not accepting a job, I'm leaving a job, and I could easily blame it on my spouse also. But I have to admit, it has appealed to me too to be closer to our first grandchild and our other children. It has been a genuine privilege to serve as the service chief of the Leukemia Service here for the last 12 years. And I have a lot of people to thank. First of all, Marcel, who uh, entrusted me with the service, who believed in me, who's been a constant source of support. Marcel and I, I think it, I had, I had, we had been in many discussions and then we met at Ash. We agreed to meet at Ash. And um, he sat down and said, you have to come. I remember he said, you just have to come. Why won't you come? You have to come, you have to come. And I have to admit, as, as is often the case, Marcel was right. And I'm glad I did. David remembers things exactly right also. He came to Chicago. We had breakfast, a late breakfast at the corner bakery in the medical center. And David sort of said the same thing. He said, why won't you come? We need you to come, you have to come. And David, as often in the case, was also right. I have a lot of people to thank. I'll be as brief as I can, other than uh, uh, Marcel and David. Let me mention our nursing staff, who are the superb, most superb nurses in the world. They're the best nurses on this planet or any other planet. Our APPs, both inpatient and outpatient uh, setting, are talented clinicians all. A very special thank you to Bernadette Coelho, who's been my clinical partner for nine years. No smarter or finer clinician exists. 
our leukemia service pharmacists, invaluable colleagues who impart their great expertise with us on a daily basis, our CRO staff who do so much for our clinical trials enterprise, Raman and Ethan, absolutely superb administrative assistants who care very much about me and the service. Colleagues from other services, some of which are here and some of which are not, of course, within the division and outside the division, it's been an honor to be a colleague of theirs. I've also had the privilege remarkably uh, to have a three fellows in my three half-day clinics for all 11 and a half years. I've never been without a fellow and it's been a privilege to work with them. We have the most superb fellows in the world. And the Leukemia Service faculty, I'm in awe of each one of you. Thank you for making this service what I think is could be arguably the most outstanding leukemia service in the country. We have a lot of accomplishments and a lot to be proud of. We tripled almost together under Marcel's leadership. We've tripled the number of, just about under tripling the number of faculty. And as we've heard today, we have a lot of young faculty. We have quintupled the number of accruals to our innovative clinical trials. We've had a dramatic increase in the number of trials. I'm not sure if everyone knows this, but in the last 10 years, the Leukemia Service has won the fellowship awarded Leukemia uh, Fellowship Awarded Teaching uh, Award three times, 2011, 2016, and 2021. So the service is due again in 2026. Importantly, we've contributed a tremendous amount to the, uh, and a tremendous amount of advances in the field scientifically. And we've helped the, uh, improve a lot of patients uh, uh, tremendously. And we've done so in a culture of respect and genuine admiration. And that's no small uh, feat. And I'm myself, I'm looking forward to see how the next chapter unfolds for the leukemia service here at Sloan Kettering for the next 12 years, and I'm sure it will be exciting. So thank you all very much. Um, <clears throat> thank you to, to all of our speakers. And of course, um, <clears throat> thank you to Marty uh, for everything.